Good morning, Highway Christian Fellowship. Pastor Ralph here. It's so great to be with you today for our online gathering. I am so glad that we could be here together. In a moment, we are going to worship in song, and then I'm going to share a message simply entitled, The Church at Prayer. We continue our series, our journey through Acts, called Unstoppable. What difference does prayer make? I'm sure you've wondered that, you've asked that. Well, we're going to look at that question today. What difference does prayer make? At any time this morning, you can request prayer by connecting with us through the uh, prayer uh, link, or you can also give at any time during this service through hcfsydney.ca or through the giving link on your screen. We're going to open in prayer. We're going to commit this service to the Lord and let's expect great things from God today. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and I thank you that we can gather together uh, in our homes and together we can worship and to, and to praise you. And we expect God for your uh, provision and your presence to be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're excited to be here with us, give us a high five in the chat. Let us know where you're uh, watching from. Let's now worship with our voices together with the worship team.
bit of a different location this morning. Normally I preach uh, in the auditorium with my back to the stage, but this morning in light of the topic I want to talk about today, I thought I would share this morning from our church prayer room. For those who may be watching for the first time, our church prioritizes prayer. And we have a prayer room if you have a need or if you would like a quiet place to come and pray, you can 
come to the church at uh, any time from Monday to, to Friday and uh, Thursday night. We have a prayer meeting here at the church. But uh, this is a very, very special place. And this is where the action happens. When God's people pray. We're going to look at Acts chapter 4 in just a moment. But I want to begin with a story for us today. One day a woman was rushing home from a doctor's appointment. The doctor had been somewhat delayed at the hospital and the lab work took a little longer than usual. So by the time she left the clinic, she was running a, quite a bit behind schedule. She still had to pick up her prescription, pick up the children from the babysitter and get home and make supper. All in time to make it to the prayer meeting at her church that evening. As she began to circle the busy Walmart parking lot, looking for a space, the windows of heaven were opened and a downpour began. While she wasn't usually the type to bother God with small problems, she began to pray as she turned down, the, turned down row after row to the row closest to the front door. Lord, she prayed, you know what kind of a day I've had. Please, if it's not too much to ask, could you grant me a parking spot closest to the door so I don't get drenched? The words weren't even out of our mouth when the, the reverse lights of a car right next to a handicapped parking lot straight on to the front door of the store became available. The woman just simply said, never mind God, something just opened up. Is this how we pray? Is this is how God means for us to pray yet this is how many people pray and they treat God as if he were a genie in heaven who is who uh, only comes out when we rub our Bibles a few times and we need some help is this how God really intended prayer to operate C.H. Spurgeon said this about prayer and the church the condition of the church may be very accurately gauged by its prayer meetings. So is the prayer meeting a graceometer, and from it we may judge of the amount of divine working among a people. If God be near a church, it must pray. And if he be not there, one of the first tokens of his absence will be a slothfulness in prayer. Why does it seem there's so little prayer? I mean, if I were to ask for a show of hands, I am sure 100% would answer yes to the question, is prayer a priority for the church? We all agree that it is. Yet, it seems to be the hardest of all the disciplines to practice, and for churches as a whole, it seems it's one of the least attended meetings on any weekly church calendar. Why so little prayer? Well. There are those who say, I just don't have time, Pastor. I mean, who has the time to pray between two jobs, picking the kids up from school, taking them to soccer, dance class, and other activities? In other words, it's just not convenient. Maybe it's because no one has been taught to pray. We have teachings on evangelism, the Holy Spirit, the victorious light. We have teachings on the end times on every topic available. But the one topic that the disciples themselves asked Jesus seems to be absent. Perhaps we need to have a class on prayer. Perhaps we've become comfortable with our technology, programs, methods that we've not given prayer priority. In fact, while I was surfing some church websites, I couldn't help but notice how many churches now are introducing uh, classes and seminars on how to run uh, successful online church services, but very little on prayer. In Canada, we have wealth, power, and all the conveniences at our fingertips. so why pray? Perhaps after all is said and done, maybe the lack of prayer is somehow connected to people not realizing the difference that a com church community united in prayer will make. Well, what difference does prayer make? 
Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 20, when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure I'll be there. Jesus says that when the church comes together to pray, we are assured and assured of the promise of his presence. And my friend, his presence makes all the difference in the world. We've been doing a journey through the book of Acts. And in the 28, chapter, 28 chapters of Acts, over the 60 years that it chronicles, during this period, prayer is front and center in the life and ministry of the church. In fact, no less than 32 occurrences happen where the church as a whole comes together to pray whether it's on Pentecost, whether it's to pray for the, the apostles' deliverance from prison, whether it's in facing uh, persecution, whatever it was, we find that prayer not only was a priority for the church, it was their life. It was part and parcel of who they were. Jim Cimbala rightfully observes, the birth of the church was during a prayer meeting, not preaching, not singing, but prayer. Why was prayer such a powerful part of the church's life? What was it about their prayer that made a difference in their community? What we discover is the church did not mean meet to simply pray out of duty or performance. They did not gathered to pray because it was the only thing to do on a Friday night. No, they did not pray because they had to. They did not pray only when life was good, but no matter where they were, when they came together, they prayed in good times and bad. In every day of every week of every month of the year, they came together and they prayed. You see, prayer is not the last thing the church does. Prayer is all that it does. What makes the difference in prayer? It's when we realize that. That prayer is not the last thing we do. It is all that we do. And when a community is united in prayer, it makes all the difference in the world. So let's take a look at one of the first instances of the church at prayer and let's see what God has for us to learn. Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. When Peter and John had gone up to the temple and prayed, they encountered a lame man, you'll remember, and they, he was healed in Jesus' name. Once he was healed, he started leaping and jumping and praising God in the temple. Peter preached a sermon Several thousand were saved. When the religious elite heard about this, they were annoyed. And so they arrested Peter and John. The leaders further threatened Peter not to teach anymore in Jesus' name. So what do Peter and John do? Do they cower in fear? Do they go back to their fishing boats? No. Their first response is to meet with the church and pray. Look at verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand would happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. What difference prayer makes? 
when the church comes to pray together, we find our support in community. Look at verse 21. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. The New American Standard Version says, uses the word companions. Another translation says their own people. The point is, they knew they needed to be with people of like mind, like heart, and like passion, and with prayer as a priority. They had just been ordered not to preach in Jesus' name. They have a sword hanging over their head if they do. There would be many who would say, just give up, guys. There's no sense. You're all alone. Where is God in this? But they don't cower in fear. They don't raise their hands in objection. No. They just simply leave the uh, hall that they were in, and the very pr first place they attend is the place where the people of God are gathered to pray. You see, prayer begins in community. I know many of you probably are saying, well, I pray in my home. I pray in the woods. I pray by the ocean. Guess what? So do I. I love going down to the pier at Sydney and praying. But folk, there is nothing that can be compared to when God's people come together in community. Because God's will is not that we would be separated from the body and live life on our own, but that we would live this Christian life in community with one another. And that prioritizes prayer. I am so glad to be part of a church that prioritizes prayer. On Thursday nights at 7, we come together and we pray for our church. We pray for you. We pray for our community. We pray for our nation. We pray for one another. But we pray. We're praying in community. We're praying in unity for God's will to be done in Sydney as it is in heaven. Are you part of a community? Are you part of a community group? I know we are online. Some of you cannot come to our uh, in-house service. But there are places, there are opportunities that you can join together. And, uh, hope, Lord willing, in the not too distant future, we'll have a Zoom uh, meeting where people can come and gather online to pray. However you gather, let's gather in community to pray together. We find support in community, and it's in community where we learn to focus on God's sovereignty. We read in verse 24, when these faithful friends heard the report from Peter and John, they raised their voices to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. The first thing they do is to praise God and to pray. There is a pattern we see throughout the book of Acts. And it's dupl duplicated time and again. Preaching leads to persecution, which leads to praise, which leads to prayer. And the cycle just keeps going. But notice what the church does not do. They do not complain to the authorities. They don't organize a protest, attack the, the religious elites, or boycott the temple. They were earnest and united as they offer up their unselfish adoration to Almighty God. And notice what they do. They focus on God's sovereignty. What does God's sovereignty mean? It simply means God is in control. The word that Luke uses is the Greek word we could translate despot. It has the idea of a master possessing absolute authority. The same word is used by Simeon in Luke 2.29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Essentially what it means is that as we come to God and we recognize his uh, authority, we recognize his sovereignty, we recognize that he is in control. The church was facing a dire situation. The church was facing an axe 
the threat of persecution, the loss of their freedom, the loss of their lives, imprisonment, even death. But yet, in spite of the opposition and the fire of persecution burning under their feet, they remained stalwart as they looked up and they worshipped and declared that God is sovereign. This didn't surprise God. They realized that this situation was not a surprise to God and that they were in his hands and that no one could take them out of his hands and no amount of persecution could hinder their relationship with the Almighty and the Almighty was in control. He was in control and he was also the creator. God is over all because he made all. Not only did he create the heavens and the earth and the sea, but everything in them. This is how Nehemiah prays in Nehemiah 9 verse 6. You are the Lord, you alone, you made the heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the sea and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Oh, my friend, wherever you are today, I want you to be encouraged that as we worship, we serve a creator who is in control of the universe. He sees where you are. He knows what you are facing. It is no surprise to him. And as you place your trust in him, you can be assured of his loving, caring hold on your life. He will bring you through. He holds you he holds your life, he holds your family, and he holds our church in his hands. C.S. Lewis writes, in God you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. Of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. My friend, I challenge us, I encourage us, let's, in the face of opposition, let's look up and let's worship our sovereign God. And as we do, we will fortify ourselves with scripture. One of the best ways to, cha to change our thoughts to fill our is to fill our mind with the word of God. Look at verse 25. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. Here we see the blending of, of the divine with the human as the Holy Spirit brings divine inspiration to his word. The church, in facing opposition, recognizes God's sovereignty and they are gripped, they are, they are filled with scripture. They begin to quote Psalm 2, 1 and 2. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his anointed. The word rage here is used of a wild horse snorting and it comes to refer to someone who is haughty and proud. Even though the people plot even though the enemies of the church plan, their plans are empty, aimless, and in vain. Verse 4 of Psalm 2 tells us that God does what he sees, how, tells us what God does when he sees how proud people react. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And we see something similar in Isaiah 8.10. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will stand for God is with us. Oh, when we are under attack from the enemy, when we are filled with uh, word, thoughts of doubt, fear, and trepidation, when uh, the world makes threats, you know how God responds? He laughs. When God hears it, he just, really? Is that the best you can do? He is the sovereign, almighty, creator God who's control of this earth and he is holding you and I in his hands and nothing can take that away from us. The church found support and community. They were focused in God's sovereignty. They fortified themselves in scripture. So what do you do now? What are you doing? Now? Well, you proceed with your petition. If we want to be bold, 
I, I, I love this. I, I, I read this this week from one commentator and I just had to share it with you. He said this, if we want to be bold and not fold when hard times come, we must be proactive by finding the support of others, by focusing on sovereignty of God, and by fortifying ourselves in Scripture. I love what he said. I love that phrase. If we want to be bold and not bold. I love that. Remember that. You've got God's church. You've got community. You've got the sovereign God for you. You've got the word of God in you. So don't be afraid to bring your petition to God. Notice the three requests the church makes. Number one, they ask God to see their situation. Verse 29, we, they pray, Now, Lord, look upon their threats. They're not denying reality. It's a serious situation. They're not making light of the situation. But they honestly express to God, you would say, well, God already knows. Yes, he does. But maybe we need to say it. Maybe we need to hear ourselves say it. God, we're in trouble. God, I need help. God, we need you. We, Lord, we don't know what to do. We need to be honest and sincere with what we are feeling. Tell God your situation. This church, we're affirming the truth that God sees and knows everything. And so God invites us to call him by name. And one of those names in Hebrew is El Roi, the God who sees. Exodus 2.25, Moses said, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Another translation puts it like this. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. God sees your situation. He knows what you're going through. Do not be afraid to tell him. Secondly, ask God to help you speak boldly. It's incredible that in the midst of so much opposition, these believers ask for boldness, not for their problems to go away. They ask for boldness, power, uh, and not protection. They ask for the power and boldness for what? to speak the word of God, to continue to tell others the good news about Jesus. Remember what we said last week? Persecution does not stop the propagation of the gospel, but it serves to promote the preaching of the gospel. This church understands that. There is no persecution that could be imposed upon them that could thwart the work and will of God in preaching the good news. And so they asked for boldness and power to speak God's word. Finally, they asked for the that God would do the miraculous. Check out their expectancy in verse 30. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through your name, through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Are we willing to pray for boldness? And are we willing to pray for the supernatural? Are we willing to expect when the supernatural comes to speak the word of God? I believe that the supernatural is real. I believe that God still heals and performs miracles today. The mission, our message, and miracles work together to point people to Jesus. Let's be bold to ask God for power and for his supernatural intervention in the lives of our family, our church, our friends, and our community. So, after we have prayed and asked God for the miraculous, after we've asked God for boldness, after we have been together in community and sought uh, the sovereign God, what do we do now? What does prayer and community do? What difference does our prayer make, Pastor Ralph? Well, consider how God prepares his church for his provision. God is going to shake things up. 
I'm not sure these followers were fully prepared for what happened in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. The word shaken here means unexpected, rocking, waving, and tottering. Something similar happened in response to Paul and Silas when they sang praises while in prison. In Acts 16.26, Luke records, And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all of the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Shaking in Scripture is always a sign that God's presence is with his people. Before God gave the Ten Commandments, we read in Exodus 19, verse 18, Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it with fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. When God wanted to use Isaiah the prophet, he first shook him up according to Isaiah 6, 4. And the foundations of the threshold shook the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Folk, when we pray, and we pray in community, and we trust in a sovereign God, and we ask for boldness, he answers accordingly, and he answers by his presence in shaking our lives. I believe when he comes in his presence, he will shake things that need to be shaken. When he comes in his presence and his power, he will shake things out of our lives that have held us in bondage. He will shake those habits. He will shake those chains. He will shake those sins. He will shake those things that are keeping us from moving forward in our faith. He comes to shake and to change us by the power of his spirit yes he will change things and he will fill us with the holy spirit in verse 31 we see that god is the one here who does the filling and they were all filled with the holy spirit i have been asked pastor how can God give any more of the Holy Spirit. Did we, didn't we receive all the Holy Spirit when we were saved? Yes. When you and I accepted Christ as our Savior, our sins were forgiven and the Holy Spirit came to indwell us, came to uh, possess us. And now we have all the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said to his disciples to wait for the promise of power from on high. And on Acts 2, 4, the whole, according to his word, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Later on, Peter is, uh, is preaching and it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Here again, the church is praying and they're being filled again with the Holy Spirit. Did they lose any of the Holy Spirit from Pentecost? Absolutely not. But right now, the Holy Spirit is being poured out in a fresh way, in a new way, to uh, empower his people for new works of service. My friend, our church needs that. We can have all the best technology in the world. We can have the best worship team in the world. We can have the best programs in the world. We can fill this building with people dancing, shouting, and praising. But folk, all of the technology, all of the stuff, all of the attraction is nothing because it will not bring life change. The only thing that will be, bring change to your life, the only thing that will bring change to our church, the only thing that will be, bring change to Sydney is a fresh pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I love the Holy Spirit. He is so wonderful. And he comes just when we need him. God, do it again. Fill us again. Then finally, God gives them boldness. God gives them boldness. It's fascinating how the filling of the Spirit is often linked to a bold gospel witness. I don't want you to make a mistake. I don't want you to make a mistake in thinking, number one, that if you have spoken in spiritual language, have the gift of tongues, that that's it. 
The gift of tongues is not a badge to boast in, nor is it a club to pounce others with who don't have the gift. The gift of tongues is just that. It's a gift that God gives as a sign, that as the sign that God has given his initial outpouring to his, fault, to his children. But the purpose is to empower you to be a bold, living witness for Jesus. Understand that. God wants you to be a bold witness for Jesus. And so he's longing to fill you with his spirit. Are you willing to ask him this morning? Are you willing to receive that empowering? It's interesting how in the book, book of Acts, the number of times this boldness is connected to preaching the gospel. Acts 9.27 tells us Barnabas vouched for Paul's conversion, pointing out how at Damascus he preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Acts 13.46, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. Acts 14.3, so they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord. Acts 19.8, and he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Acts 26.26, for the king knows about these things and to him I speak boldly. More than ever, we need as a church to be bold. We need to be bold in our witness. We need to be bold in our speaking. We need to be bold in our testimony. Brothers and sisters, I challenge you to be bold and don't fold when the hard times come. Let's be proactive by finding the support from others, by focusing our faith on, this, on God's sovereignty and fortifying ourselves with scripture. Let's be prayerful by asking God to see our situation and ask him to help us to speak boldly and to do the miraculous, to do the things we can't do on our own, but only God can do through us. And finally, let's be prepared for God to shake things up, to fill us with the Holy Spirit, and to give us boldness to declare his name wherever we go. In a moment, we're going to worship more with the worship team. But before we do, I'd like to pray with you today. And I'd particularly like to pray for anyone, for you who are watching, and you would say, you know what, Ralph, this is all Greek to me. I, I, I don't know Jesus, but there's something in me. There's something inside of me that wants to know who this Jesus is, that he's not another religion. It's not another creed, but it's a living relationship. I want to pray with you. And secondly, I want to pray with some of you who you're facing some opposition and you're cowering in fear. You're afraid. I challenge you today, I'm going to pray for you today to, be, to have a fresh filling of the Spirit that God will give you the boldness that you need to face whatever situation. He already knows. He's sovereign. He's got you in His hands. He's not going to let you go. Will you trust Him? And will you ask Him to fill you today? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, for my friends who are watching who don't know you. And I ask, Lord, as they turn to you, that they would lift their heart and faith in you today and simply pray, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I've gone my own way. I turn to you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising from the dead. Thank you for calling me. Come into my life. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to serve you all my life. Lord, for my brothers and sisters who are they're going th through a hard time, they're facing an uncertain future, 
I pray for them today as they put their faith in you. I pray, God, that you would uh, reveal yourself as the sovereign Lord of their lives, that you're in control. Lord, that they would lay hold of your word and that, God, that they would, uh, Lord, uh, receive a fresh filling of your spirit that they can serve you with boldness. In Jesus' name. We're going to sing one more song. And as we do, you may wish prayer. And you can ask for prayer uh, right there by clicking the link. And someone, a host, will be happy to pray with you. And uh, we just want you to know that God loves you. God's with you. And uh, let's just worship God together right now.
I want to thank you once again for joining with us today. I trust that the worship and the word has been an encouragement to you and is helpful to you in your walk of faith. If you prayed uh, earlier to receive Christ as your Savior, we would love to be able to help you. You can contact us at hcfsydney.ca and a pastor uh, would be happy to make connection with you. Whatever your need is, if you would like prayer or help with your walk of faith, you can contact us through our church website, call us at the church, and we would be happy to help you as best we can. God bless, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.